Hello, and welcome to the Euro What, episode number 55 for the week of June 17, 2019. I'm Mike McComb, and I'm joined today by Ben Smith. Hey, Ben. Hey, Mike. We are a pair of Americans trying to make sense of the Eurovision Song Contest, and this week we'll be talking about NBC's Songland. How's it going, Ben? It's good. There is no news about the Eurovision Song Contest, which is both a relief and also just feels real weird. Yeah, yeah. This has been like a, it feels like an extended vacation in a way. Yeah, and like it's, it's <laughs> yeah. quiet, but like we're in the, it's too quiet. On the other hand, like we had like a busy year last year mm-hmm. and there were so many controversies and it feels like there are not going to be as, as many of those this time. Yeah, you can just sort of tell that there's just kind of a different organizational framework that that seems like a diplomatic way of saying it organizational framework (laughs) yes uh, i mean there there are a whole bunch of cities uh in the netherlands that are pitching right now to be uh the host city but that process is still in its early stage so not much to talk about yet i guess the thing to talk about right now is the american song contest that was a story that popped up during eurovision week that kind of got buried because that's what happens when you drop a news story in the Wednesday of Eurovision week. Yeah, like that. It's like dropping like a big news release in America on like Friday during mm-hmm. Memorial Day weekend. Is that no one's going to look at it? It's the perfect time to hide a thing. Yeah, and and we did talk about it closer to like when the announcement came out that uh, Christopher Bjorkman's production company is in the process of developing a format for what they're calling uh, the American Song Contest, which would be trying to bring some version of the Eurovision format uh, to the United States, uh, not so that the United States could compete at Eurovision, just so that there could be some sort of Eurovision-esque thing. Thing, De- yeah. Yeah, De- details are sparse at the moment. Details are sparse. They planned it for 2021, which is great because it means there's no accountability to ever get to that date. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there's there's no network attached. There's no um, really no details. Like even the title "American Song Contest" is just kind of written in twelve point Helvetica font. Like it's it's just very just, bare just bones. Just like a big TBD in brackets after the name of that. Mm-hmm. It could happen, or again, we could just forget and be like, "Oh man, yeah, we did say twenty twenty one, didn't we?" Ah, youth. No, uh, no. you know, just down the road. Yeah. They could just keep using the excuse, oh, you know, we're in turnaround right now, and yeah, we, we just got to go back to the drawing board, fix a couple things, and uh, It is just yeah. so busy in May, you guys, and also I need to wash my hair. I don't know. The more that I think about it, the more I just kind of dread the idea. Oh, yeah, no. Like, <laughs> we, we had this discussion last summer, and we said, mm-hmm. no, we should not do this. Christian Bjorkman, please refer to our episode last summer, yeah. where we decided, no, uh, America is good. We ha- We already have too many music reality shows and we do not take good care of them no no like the one that immediately jumped to mind when the news came out was uh this one that was on bravo back in 2011 i want to say called platinum hit and uh for for those who may not remember or did not watch it because i'm pretty sure i was the only person who watched it uh all the way through i watched i watched i survived two episodes of it and was like no you know what it turns out we shouldn't try to make every industry have its own project runway yeah, yeah. So, like, Platinum Hit was the search for America's next top songwriter. Uh, it was hosted by Jewel. Uh, one, the head judge was Cara Diaguardi, uh, fresh off of her stint on American Idol. Yeah, it's. I, I think it was ten contestants, and uh, each week they had to do like the hook challenge, where they were just given some very vague parameters to like come up with a hook for this type of song, and then from there just take the bones of that and try to build a full song and sometimes it was a team competition and yeah it was just trying to put the america's next top profession model onto this particular profession and it didn't really work no like, it, it did not take yeah. i do like that we as a nation were given two tries to make cara diaguardi a thing and we said no we're good yeah yeah and, uh, and but... trying to get jewel to like branch out even more oh, yeah, no and... like i was before the show, I was like watching a few of the videos because there are videos still on the Bravo TV website, even though there's no reason for them to be there anymore. They could just bury this in the backyard. That is so crazy to me that that content is still up there. And I'm almost like afraid to leave this into the episode because it's like, no, no, no. They might take it down if they know that like somebody yes. found them. <laughs> on the other hand, like who is this for? Who goes to the Wikipedia page for this show besides me? 
Uh, and it's like, <laughs> I need to know more, and I want to watch video footage of this program that definitely existed. Like, I rewatched them crowning the winner, and again, it just feels like Project Runway Top Chef. Yeah, but just not, like, writing is just not a telegenic activity? No, like, just the way, well, the way that they went about doing it was not particularly telegenic. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't lead itself to visual results, because, again, the other shows where Bravo was doing this in 2011... Makes sense. Project Runway, you get to see a finished garment at the end of the week's mm-hmm. challenge. Top Chef, you get to see the food. Sheer genius. Everybody knows what haircuts look like. Right. Platinum hit. You don't quite get the same feeling, even though it is a song, and there's going to be a performance of that song. It just doesn't hook you. Ha. Yeah. Doesn't hook you <laughs> the same way uh, as those other industries. So I, it doesn't surprise me that they decided that they were, that was going to be a one and done. I'm glad that they ran the whole series because I, w- I was recapping it for uh, a, t- a television website when it was on. And like I did enjoy writing about it. I learned that uh, Jewel fans do not have a sense of humor. It was an interesting experiment. And I am kind of I'm glad that they tried it, even though, like, yeah, it just did not work, mm-hmm. which is what kind of made me apprehensive about a show that debuted on NBC a few weeks ago called Songland. It's not the same format at all like i thought it was going to be a oh, long yeah, no, form like, we, competition the wonderful series. thing about eight years of reality content is that we now have new shows to model things on mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so like this if, one is if, kind of more of the like the voice meets chopped i like that because chop you have that cut down over a couple of rounds and then you also have celebrity mentors mm-hmm. well semi-celebrity mentors yeah, although I w- it would be kind of fun if they had, like, surprise ingredients that you had to throw into your song, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm not sure that works. Anyway, the, the way that this show works is uh, there is the Artist of the Week. So far in the three episodes they've had, they've uh, it's been John Legend, Will I Am from Black Eyed Peas, and uh, Kelsey Ballerini. They're working with a panel of experts, uh, Shane McAnally, uh, Esther Dean, and Ryan Tedder. And there are four contestants that come in, each with a song demo. And they perform the song, and the artist of the week picks the three that they want to work with to try to turn it into a hit song or their next single. Like, they have four people come in, and they do, like, that NBC thing where they do a montage about mm. what their what their life is like and how their family feels and what challenges they're facing, and they do this while, like, you hear a little, a little snippet of the song and see lyrics on screen. It's very touching. And by touch, I'm, I'm being sarcastic on that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, yes, NBC, we get it. They have lives. But yeah, then they come in, they do their demo. And the thing I like is that, like, at the demo stage, we hear version one of the song. Uh, and then in the room, even if they're not going to go through, like, they've gotten a little bit of feedback from the judges and mentors on, okay, here's how we could adapt this for this artist. Here's how we could take what's already good and make it stronger. Like, that's the thing I like about this show, is that we're starting out with good bones all around. Mm -hmm. Even when it's for an artist who I generally do not like their their style. So, like, the entirety of that Will I Am episode, I'm just like, (laughs) I would listen to none of these songs. Exactly. But I liked that you get to see these aspiring songwriters get constructive feedback on here. Here's how you could make this better and stronger and more more adaptable. I also really appreciate how they're not dumbing things down for the audience. A lesser show would just have, like, graphics flying all across the screen and, like, words being defined everywhere. And like, Oh, yeah, it would just be, like, telling us week after week, the chorus, as as Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it, is mm -hmm. is this. And, like, this show is just like, no, you're you're coming to this show because you have an interest in pop song craft, and we're going to respect that. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like they go right into talking shop and getting into process and demoing what those changes would sound like, like instantly. And like everybody's there to collaborate. And yeah, like you don't have any joke auditions or anything like that. Like these are all, all four songs are viable entries. And the reasons that the ones that get eliminated don't advance is just because it's like, oh, well, it's not quite the brand of this artist. But it could be a brand of another artist. Like, I I would not be surprised if a couple of these contestants come back in future episodes just because their song would be a better match for that week's Artist of the Week. Oh, yeah. And, and like, I love that sometimes it's like, okay, so this is a great song and this is a great song for you. And I don't want to take it. I don't want to make this. I don't want to depersonalize this Mm -hmm. so that we can fit it in Kelsey Ballerini's wheelhouse. Like, this is totally your song. 
Yeah, yeah. I guess my only critique of that part of the process is I'm not sure it's necessary to have four contestants. I would agree with you that it feels a little extraneous, but I guess they want to kind of fit it into standard reality show protocol in the U.S., yeah, I, I can understand the impulse of wanting to introduce stakes of like, oh, one of these songs just isn't going to make it through. But it's just like, well, you know, nobody's here for that. They're they're here for this is what we've got. C- let's collaborate and make this better. And I think also if they had one fewer song, that just leaves more time for processy stuff. And that's what I'm more interested in. So after the three songs are selected, each song is assigned to one of the permanent panelists to go through a production phase of like rewriting the lyrics, changing up the instrumentation, like just going through and doing the full workshop process on the song for a final draft sort of performance. And Mm -hmm. this is a section that I would really love there to be more time just because it it feels so rushed. And it's like, like I I would really love to, and I don't know how you would demonstrate this visually, but like kind of showing the before and after or like better charting the transition from what the song started at. Yeah. Yeah. Give me timestamps in a Chiron showing, Hey, this is at like, 9 a.m. on Thursday, and then here Mm -hmm. we are at, like, noon on Friday. Here we are at 4 p.m. on Friday. Again, like, just cut out, like, one of those songs that isn't going to make it. Give me more of the the actual process and the actual, hey, we're hanging out in the room and we're thinking about how to work with this. Uh, Here we are talking with the artist just to see if this this is flowing with them or what notes they specifically have. Things like that. Once the production round is done, all three contestants perform their revamped versions of the song for the artist of the week. And... One of them is selected to be that artist's next single. The ones that aren't selected as the next single could still be selected for inclusion on an album. Uh, that was the case for the like Will I Am episode where, <laughs> yeah, all, all three songs were selected, which feels a little bit like a cop out, especially if you are going to have oh, this like totally. false stakes thing. The whole yeah. the whole speech at the end of I'm clearing three songs off of my album, especially as like episode two of the show where we have just learned the rules mm-hmm. to immediately kind of bend them. I did not love that, but I, I don't know, like all three of those final songs did feel like different tracks of a Black Eyed Peas album. Yeah, all three were profoundly irritating earworms. Oh, yes, yes. The one that won... The one that won that episode. Oh my gosh. Like it came in and I did not like it at all. No. And I was just, uh, but like the second it started, I'm like, yep, this is the winner. Mm-hmm. This is the winner. I did like that in, in the rewriting process, although it did not get mentioned, which probably for the best, the thing I did like is that they did sort of quietly make the first verse not about telling some lady to smile. <laughs> <laughs> They're going, no. Oh no. Please let somebody in the room say, hey. Hey, what if this song wasn't about telling someone to smile? Even though the Will I Am episode was, it's not that it wasn't for me. Like, Mm -hmm. I was still able to appreciate the episode from the branding perspective, where it's just like, oh, no, like all three of these are completely on brand for the audience. It kind of reminded me of the uh, AMC show, The The Pitch, uh, Mm -hmm. that they used to pair with Mad Men. The marketing aspect of it and like how, how you can take a song that may sound completely outside of somebody's wheelhouse and just make little tweaks here and there. And that's the thing. So many of these tweaks that they're making are kind of minor. Like, it's just Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, like, rather than going up at this part, you should go down at this part because that's going to change the mood this way. Or, Mm -hmm. like, just do one or two word changes here, not necessarily rewrite the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And it just makes such a huge difference. On the other hand, like, I also love when they do see, like, the the good, meaty middle of a song and go, okay, what if we made the backing instrumentation sound a little less like The Little Mermaid? Mm-hmm. And what if we, we stripped this back, had this be piano? That's much in, more in line with what John Legend will sing. Mm-hmm. I saw why that one won, even though I thought one of the other two songs was a little bit stronger in my eyes. And, I like, the one thing, the other criticism I've had is, like, the songs that have kind of won have all been a little bit middle of the road for me. But that could just be kind of like the television singing competition effect, because I feel like those are always kind of middle of the road winners. This is a weird one when it comes to like the aftermarket aspect, like because it does have to be a song that is good for TV and good for like 
that kind of broad audience. But then the song is also like immediately available on Spotify and uh, Apple Music and like all the streaming services and all the places to download it. But an interesting exercise in just like the reach of this. And it's just like, okay, is this song actually getting to the audience, the correct audience for the artist? And yeah, I, I'm I'm hoping that there's an article that comes out once this show is done about how successful these songs are or like how if, – if this process works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, because like I, I was immediately just thinking, oh, man, I wonder like at the end of the season if it would make sense to go back and look at Spotify streams to see if the winners are are getting more are getting more plays than mm-hmm. the, the songs they beat out. Yeah. Like the way that this show is working is – is interesting because just thinking about standard American pop songwriting and how it is this process of developing like that top line and those hooks mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mirror what's been what's been happening at Eurovision lately, if that makes sense. Because mm. like I, as as long as you were discussing this, I took a look back just because again, like a lot of modern uh, of pop songwriting for like these top level artists is happening in writing camps is happening where you have like a half dozen songwriters getting together with the artists going off and like writing these little these hooks and building these songs to kind of come together and figure that out. Right. And if you look at Eurovision the last few years, like particularly since 2016, it's been like the singer as the primary or only songwriter or at least like a clear inspiration for the song because like you have Jamala in 1944, mm-hmm. which is very personal and very much, you know, idiosyncratic to her as a performer. Salvador again like very much that person and in well, in that case, like his sister as well. Mm-hmm. Netta's kind of the outlier here in that she didn't write Toy, but like it feels very much like her sort of a deal. She did contribute the clucking. Okay, she did contribute the clucking. Well, yes, it's like when Beyonce has works with a bunch of writers and is still the executive producer on, on all the songs. Mm-hmm. And then Duncan Lawrence, of course, with Arcade. Right. So if you look in the years before then, it was much more that songwriting team thing. Like just thinking in particular, 2010, Lena and Satellite... Azerbaijan running scare was like the primo years for where they just kind of assembled their entire act in a lab, essentially. Yeah. And even like Heroes. Heroes is like a room full of people coming up with that song. Rise Like a Phoenix as well. I mean, like mm-hmm. that, even though that one, that one kind of has the veneer of being very specific and idiosyncratic and kind of in the toy meld. But yeah, like was not directly involved in the writing process it wasn't directly involved with the writing process i love conchita but i also feel like another strong singer could have like killed that song Mm. and won i have a feeling people are going to be paying a lot more attention to songwriting which is interesting just because like with eurovision like you do think a lot of it is like oh it's just about the performance and the popularity of the artist and like all of these other factors but a lot of it does kind of come back to it being about the song and just Knowing how that sausage is made, I think, is an intriguing process. So. <laughs> yes. So one of the other things I've liked about Songland is how diverse the variety of artists have been. Is mm. that we are not just operating in top 40 pop. We have had an R&B artist. We have had John Legend. We have had whatever genre the Black Eyed Peas are now. Uh, Hip hop slash electro slash pop. Just a lot of things going on in that in that stew. Mm-hmm. Um Kelsey Ballerini, uh, country and pop, which is kind of like that 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 weird middle ground that artists like Casey Musgraves and Marin Morris are kind of crossing over, and then like other artists that are like on the way sometime this season. We have the Jonas Brothers, we have Megan Trainer, uh, and we have Macklemore. Mm-hmm. Which of those three, honestly, I'm only excited about the Jonas Brothers. Oh really? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's also one of the things that I'm enjoying about the show. Like I knew nothing about Kelsey Ballerini before her episode. Pop country. It's just not a genre that I have any exposure to on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And I found her really charming. And the end product songs, it's like, oh, wow, I actually would be very interested to hear, like, what she has to offer. Like, like, I'm now very curious about her catalog. And I think that this is a great format for... Again, it kind of just gets into the branding aspect, just being like, "Oh, okay. I'm I'm very curious of like what you have to offer." So yeah, like the uh, and I think the Jonas Brothers episode is the one that's airing tonight as this episode drops, and theirs is another genre of music that I'm not all that familiar with. Like I I could not name a single Jonas Brothers song. Well, same, and, and like I think yeah. they are particularly interesting because what they have come like they they're having a comeback right now. Mm-hmm. And they are doing things that are a little bit different than like their first round of songs, which I know nothing about. Mm-hmm. Like the I, I've followed the various 
brothers Jonai as they have have <clears throat> done like they have they have tried various solo things to to some success. One of them had uh, Cake by the Ocean a few years ago, which has felt very different from like kind of the the Disney Channel pop, but so many things do. Uh, <laughs> They, they were on SNL as the musical guest towards the end of the season, and I liked what they were doing. It felt it felt like a much more refined version of kind of the teeny bopper stuff they had been doing. So I'm intrigued to see like what what that room with them looks like. They would also be the first group yes. that's participated. So it's like, oh, there's just going to be a, a lot of cooks in that kitchen. Yeah, just uh, a lot so, of voices there. You know, there are some aspects of the series that could use a little bit of tweaking particularly if it gets to season two but overall i'm really enjoying this show it, it, it's been like a nice summer diversion where i still get to think about music mm-hmm. and there is a companion podcast that goes along with it because that's the law in twenty. yeah that's how we do things now you have your television <laughs> program and you have the after show available on itunes yeah and it's, it's a good listen on wednesday mornings uh on your commute uh definitely recommend it it's on uh nbc tuesday nights um at 10 eastern something like that i don't know if yeah. you're like me and you and you kind of constantly <laughs> forget when it's on uh, it's also on hulu the next day that's how, exactly. that's how i've been picking yeah. it up yes hulu probably the nbc app i don't know <laughs> T- time time is a social construct at this point yeah so <laughs> yeah. uh anything else before we sign off Let's enjoy this weird liminal space between Eurovisions. That's going to do it for this episode of the EuroWhat. Thanks for listening. The EuroWhat podcast is hosted by Mike McComb, that's me, and Ben Smith. That's me. You can find us on our website at EuroWhat.com and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at EuroWhat. We'd love to hear your questions and comments. You can subscribe to the EuroWhat on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice. Rating and reviewing the podcast when you subscribe also helps other Eurovision fans find us. We'll be back in two weeks to try to make sense of what's new in Eurovision. 